Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Today, we're going to space. Now, for those of you new to the channel, what I normally do is fill in every last tile so that we have a nice flat rocket platform. Unfortunately, the environment barrier goes all the way up here, and that would be a gross negligent waste of granite or igneous rock or anything else. So this time, I think we're actually gonna start our spaceport from the lowest area where there is no background. And the rest, I guess we'll just fill in with oxygen and start to build there too. But first, a couple of updates. I loaded this up with polluted water. I was gonna use petroleum, but we had a fresh source of polluted water right here. And as pointed out in a couple of the comments, if we don't need to go below minus 20, well, you can use polluted water just the same. The great thing about polluted water is it does have a little bit higher of a specific heat capacity, about double that of petroleum. It doesn't have as much thermal conductivity, so it'll take a while to transfer the heat, but once it has it, it'll keep it for longer. And then also pointed out in the comments that apparently they changed the way the mechanics work on the Slicksters. Slicksters can now drown. What they will do is they'll float to the top of any water. So I just filled it in capped it off, and now they drown in here. But then I realized, why not just use this area as our drowning chamber? We already have it set up. So we've rerouted all of our extra slickster eggs to come down through here, and it makes its way down through the conveyor rails of our hatch farms. So all there's left to do is actually transfer all the critter eggs over. And that we just select critter eggs. It'll pick them all up. It's going to take a little bit because there's a lot of eggs. And then... We can just leave this as our coolant tank for our sleetweed farms. And as you can see, our sleetweed is starting to propagate fairly nicely. And since our sleetweed started coming in, we've now switched over to creating berry sludge out of the bristle blossoms. The problem is, as you can see, Dr. Banner prefers his berry sludge instead of whatever's in the refrigerator. We need to stop that from happening. We're just going to go to consumables and prevent them from eating berry sludge. Now, what's invariably going to happen is I'm going to send somebody into space with all the beautiful berry sludge and forget to turn on the fact that they can eat the berry sludge, which means they're going to starve to death. But we'll cross that bridge when we get there. The only slight modification we made to the kitchen is we added an auto sweeper here that has access to the deep freezer. So it'll be responsible for loading up this new refrigerator and the microbe musher. Now, the only bad thing about our system is I'm gonna have to stare at a conveyor loader and an auto sweeper. I could open the top up and deconstruct it, but then we're gonna see the debris. And we all know how I feel about debris. Yeah, talking about you there, granite. So with the creation of our rocketry program, we need to make sure that there's no background on our rocket platforms. And the reason why you don't want that is let's say the rocket is sitting here. But well, what'll happen is when the rocket takes off, all of the exhaust will be sitting in this environment. What I'd absolutely love is a way to actually remove this background area. That would be clutch. Now, I did dig a ladder all the way to the top, and that way we could see where the ceiling was. And in fact, the ceiling is actually tall enough to make room for every rocket type. Remember, you want at least 35 tiles for your largest rockets. And I don't know if you can see that. I'll try to zoom in on edit, but that's 41 tiles. Minus two for the rocket platform. That leaves us 39 tiles, which is plenty of clearance. So then you're like, okay, well, let's just start here. Yeah, but then we're going to have all this nasty area here. So what I think that means is we're going to brick in a lot of area. Now, I know what you're saying. That would be a colossal waste of granite. Except, is it though? First thing we need to do is move our exhaust up temporarily. Let's just say here. This is where all those junk gases are going. And we'll just tie them in there. Now, looking at the material that we can build tiles out of, we have granite, igneous rock, sandstone, and sedimentary rock. So it's not a huge deal. I'm not sure if we're going to have enough granite. And granite actually has a decor bonus, so there's sometimes you want to save your granite supplies. Then there's igneous rock and sedimentary rock. Well, as luck would have it, stone hatches can eat both. And we don't want the thermal reactivity of the sedimentary rock, so we're going to use igneous rock for this. Let's see how much we waste, shall we? And since I didn't count last time, we're actually going to do it again, except this time I'm going to count and see how much we have left. So right now we have 631 tons. All said and done, we have 584. Yeah, we're definitely going to run out of materials. And boy, are we actually definitely going to be wasting some materials. But hey, at least we're not filling in everything from here up. And I did figure out one way we can waste a little less materials. We always have a service corridor. And the reason why we have a service corridor is that way you can line up your power requirements 
that your rocket platform will use. So our next line doesn't actually have to be until way up here. And then we can actually drywall all the rest in. And that way it'll also hold environment. And the reason why you want it to hold environment because there's going to be a bunch of power transformers in there and you don't want them to overheat. Another update I'm happy to report is I broke down and started segmenting the beta hives into their own rooms. And lo and behold, it's working as it's supposed to. So although it never says it in any of the database entries or even anything online, these beta hives have to be in their own room. Doesn't matter if the door is open or closed. I'm running a little bit of experiment in here with the doors closed to see which one's faster. Because what I've noticed is the bees will kind of flock to one or two beta hives when they're given the opportunity. So all the betas that are supposed to be in this hive are actually flocking over to this one. What I've also been doing is when I've noticed a beta hive is sort of bugging out, the way I kind of think this one is, I can just attack it, it'll destroy it, and then the bee tinies will make another hive. But so far it's working pretty good. Every beta hive is now actually collecting uranium ore and refining it into enriched uranium. On some of the areas that was larger, we just wrapped them indoors. The exact thing I was trying to prevent, but it's a lot better than making this whole area a room. But what's happened, because this was no longer in this area, a bee tiny actually created another hive over here. And it's the only one not covered in a door. And it's because this entire cavern is one room. So it does not matter how big the room is. A bee tiny will only create a bee hive if there's not another one in the room. No matter how big the room is. And you can see in this case, it's over a thousand tiles. Okay, so mistakes were made. Somehow I put the eggs in the deep freezer, which it's still working, but this is going to be bad. The eggs were supposed to be down here. Let's see if we can attack through diagonal, can we? And then figure out where I went wrong here. Here it was. It was all the extras that I picked up from here. This line goes directly to the deep freezer. It doesn't go to the drowning chamber. Let's bring all those eggs out, shall we? The great thing all we have to do is go to the storage bin, click critter eggs, and our auto sweepers will help us out there. Now that all the eggs are swept, we can just undo eggs. All the eggs land here, and then we can just use one of these critter locations, say sweep only, allow manual use, and we will sweep all these larva eggs up. Now eventually this molten larva slickster will die because it is entirely too cold in there for him, but it looks like it's gonna take a while. But because the deep freezer eventually is going to kill this molten larva, we're just gonna let him stay there. It's full of chlorine, so there's no carbon dioxide for him to eat, so they shouldn't put a bunch of petroleum in here. Fingers crossed. And because the dupes don't have enough building to do, we're finally gonna get around to doing the transit tubes. We tried to make sure that most everything was four tiles wide, and that way we have our transit tube access here, and then the transit tube right beside it. So now all we have to do is build it all the way up. The thing that stinks is you gotta go back and delete all the little ladder spaces. But the great thing, and the first time in a long time, we have no concerns about power and running those transit tubes. Drats. The question is, are we gonna move this entire oil well over by one tile in order to get our transit tube through? The answer is yes. Of course we are. It should be as simple as just adding insulated tiles and then we can remove this one. And look at this, now we have enough room for our transit tube. It can go all the way down to the bottom of the map now. We'll definitely want an access point here, so we'll throw in one right here. Perfect. We've made a fair bit of progress on our access tunnel. You can see it has its own transit tube access. We're still working on the main power spine, but you can see the main power spine then extends entirely through the access tunnel. And that way, any place we need power, like in this example, we just drop a large power transformer. We also have a couple of liquid reservoirs that we're gonna be putting petroleum into. Petroleum is what's going to gas our rockets. And all we did was put a liquid bridge here that says, hey, I'd rather the petroleum go this way, than head over here to be dumped into our excess petroleum tank, which is at this point quite excessive. We've also started some oxalite production. Fairly simple process. We bring oxygen in, gets thrown in the oxalite refinery with just a little bit of gold, and it spits out some oxalite. We also have a conveyor loader, because remember, if your oxalite sits in here, it's gonna end up being a hundred and something degrees. That's not what we want. The oxalite then comes up here to our main water tank and then this gets dropped off, which will lower the temperature of the oxalite fairly quickly. We keep this water at about 25 degrees, so eventually the oxalite will be down at 25 degrees. All right, change one. I didn't like how our service corridor was way down here. 
So anytime that we needed to get something to our rocket level, we would need to send the power all the way up or the petroleum pipes all the way up. Now this would give the effect of having a nice separation between the service corridor and the rocket platform, which is known to be pretty hot. But I think what we're gonna do is have two service corridors, one for the top of the colony and the other for our rocket systems. Kind of like how you know Disney World has an underground level that you've never seen? Yeah, like one of them. After a month of Sundays, we are finally complete with our spaceport construction. Now there's a couple of features I want to highlight. First, our lower level is now providing an atmosphere block for the rest of the colony, which means we can actually get rid of the abyssalite crust on top of the planetoid. I've got it set up for a lower priority dig, but eventually the planetoid will be continuous all the way up to this level. Then there's an atmosphere shaft that feeds all the way up to the top level. We have about half of it drywalled in, and the reason why we don't have this side drywalled in or this side is because this is where our rocket platforms are gonna go. And when the rockets exhaust through here, we want it to empty into the vacuum of space, unless of course we're trying to collect it, and then in which case we'll have plenty of room to try to collect it. We have our beautiful transit tube system that goes from the very top of the base all the way to the bottom. I wish there was a transport overlay. I would love to be able to just see all the ladders, the fire poles, and the transport tubes. I think that'd be pretty cool. But we have our rocket platform ready. We have plenty of steel for our space construction. We're sitting at about 82 tons. And because we were able to knock out small petroleum engine just by analyzing vents and geysers, we can go directly into this small petroleum engine. Now our first rocket is not gonna be very big. All we wanted to do is fly around, do orbital research, and do some telescoping around our couple of planetoids. For fuel delivery, we have insulated obsidian liquid pipes. They're great because they have a melting point of 2726 degrees. And we insulate them only because we're gonna have multiple rockets on this platform. And we don't want when the rockets to take off or to superheat this petroleum over time, and then all of a sudden we have bursting pipes. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to introduce you to the Interstellar Skylab 14. I can't wait until I am able to rename the rockets again. We have the small petroleum engine we already showed you. It's chocked full with 450 kilograms of petroleum. Then we have our small solid oxidizer tank where we have 225 kilograms of oxalite. And because we're using oxalite, it's a 1 to 2 ratio. In other words, if you're using 450 kilos worth of petroleum, you'll need half that amount by using oxalite. If you to use liquid oxygen, it'd be a one to four ratio. If you're using fertilizer, it's a one to one ratio. But oxalite is good, and this is giving us a total range of 10 tiles. Not too shabby. We'll go five tiles out, and then five tiles back in, and do this a few times, and it'll give us a lot of the observation. But the key to the Interstellar Skylab 14 is inside. This rocket interior is equipped with a bunch of nice rooms. It has a bedroom, it has a washroom, and a mess hall. I would have really liked to make it a great hall, but you need 32 tiles to make it a great hall. And we could have done that if we didn't have the telescope there, we could have just opened one of the mesh tiles up and it would have been big enough, but this works well. We have a couple of pictures, plenty of plants. One of them's already being stifled because of the hot plastic. That plastic should cool down in, I don't know, 40 cycles or so. And then we have the beautiful wall toilet. We have it plugged into the output pipe on the module. And if we come out here, we also have a water station set up. The water station is grabbing polluted water from the excess of our petroleum generators, splitting it off 50-50 between our storage tank and our rocketry program. It comes up here and it gets sieved, put in this nice liquid reservoir, and then loads up the wall toilet for use. We have all the plastic we need to load up our orbital data collection lab, and then we have our telescope. One change in the last patch is you actually have to order the amount of data banks that you need, which is pretty convenient. We can go in here and say, hey, we want 250 to be able to knock out improved hydrocarbon propulsion and that's all it'll produce each data bank requires five kilos of plastic so something to keep in mind we're only bringing along five tons this time because we need to cool the rest of the plastic down and then finally the perfect piece the party line phone now we're using oxalite to provide the atmosphere for inside this module eventually we'll throw some oxygen in it through the ventilation but 
for the small simple rocket we have that's not going to be permanent it's just for the exploration and the orbital research i figured this would work out well last thing we have to do is crew up the rocket and luckily we have supergirl supergirl was one of those dupes that we had gotten who likes to do a lot of things and in this case they're going to be doing rocket piloting but in order to get there, we also needed them to be able to do data analysis and astronomy. Because the whole point of this rocket is to fly around with the telescope, observing everything around, and doing the orbital data collection. And Supergirl fits that bill just right. We're loaded up with 80,000 calories, we can take her suit off, and I believe we're ready for launch. We just gotta set our destination, and I think for this case we're gonna go out here. Now you can't actually travel to here until it's been observed, but this is only three tiles away, which is perfect. Once we get there, we'll be able to set the destination again, as long as Supergirls use the telescope. Launch checklist looks good. Time to take off. Of course, the first thing Supergirl is going to do is eat and use the bathroom. We'll go ahead and start off with 99 data banks. Supergirl's doing the amazing animation of developing some data banks that we can then take back and have some science. As an indication, because it is five kilos of plastic per data bank, the orbital research is much more plastic intensive than it used to be. I've also have the telescope set on five and the orbital data collection set on four. That way, as soon as they get to an area that has some empty space, Supergirl can go ahead and reveal it before she starts doing the research. Over on our home planet, we're doing great. We're starting to dig out the rest of the areas that we can, including this crust here. Enriched uranium production is back in full bore. Our sleet wheat and berry sludge production is going great. We have 800,000 calories of berry sludge. I think once we get to a million, I'll probably turn berry sludge off and maybe turn some wonderful frost buns on, because then you could do frost buns and gristleberry for what it costs to do just berry sludge. We also completed our oxalite production. We have over 10 tons of oxalite now and these things aren't going to turn off for quite some time. If we need more we can just add them onto the stack because we have all the oxygen we need coming in and thanks to our gold volcanoes we have more gold than we know what to do with it. And then our plastic production we tied it in with the same conveyor rail that our oxalites in and that way our plastic follows the shipping rails. That way when we throw it into any sort of rockets we don't have anything to worry about. For the first time in a long time, I can say our colony is going ridiculously smooth. I wonder what's going to break next. Now, you probably will not see Supergirl in a few episodes because the act of getting all this orbital research and doing the telescope exploring is going to take a long time. I'll be doing that in the background as we further develop the rest of our space mission. I hope you had a good time during this episode. I know I did. And I'll talk to you soon.